So hi guys, welcome to the final lecture for chapter 13. First and foremost, we'll be talking about acid rain, its causes, its impacts, as well as some of its solutions. And then we're going to spend the latter half of the lecture, lecture talking about indoor air pollution and why indoor air pollution can be so insidious and harmful. Now basically, first and foremost, let's go over some definitions. Acid deposition is essentially defined as a deposition of acid or acid forming pollutants, pollutants such as sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides, things that we're going to talk about in a second, from the air onto Earth's surface. Now, specifically, acid rain refers to precipitation, any kind of precipitation, be it rain, snow, sleet, or hail, containing acidic compounds, particularly sulfuric acid and nitric acid from the pollutants that we just talked about. And then finally, atmospheric deposition is the wet or dry deposition of pollutants, things like mercury, nitrates, or organic chlorides, different toxins or pollutants that are trapped in the atmosphere and precipitate out in the rain. Now, there are two major pollutants that cause acid rain. First and foremost is sulfur dioxide, and this is produced from the incomplete burning or the incomplete cleaning or scrubbing of coal. Now, what happens is that once sulfur, sulfur is a natural part of coal, and uh, it's normally found in coal compounds. However, when coal is burned, that sulfur will react with ambient oxygen molecules to form sulfur dioxide. Similarly, nitrogen oxides are formed naturally whenever you uh, burn fossil fuels. Remember that we have nitrogen molecules and two that dominate our atmospheric uh, compounds by volume. So remember that 78% of the entire atmosphere is nitrogen. And then oxygen is 20, makes up 21% of the atmosphere. So whenever you have nitrogen and oxygen in very hot conditions, like when you're burning fossil fuels, they're normally going to create, uh, react to form nitric oxides, different NO2, NO3, NO1, different, uh, different forms of nitric oxides that can then be released as a pollutant. Now, what happens is that while these two uh, chemicals our primary pollutants are bad in their original form, typically what happens is that they will react with water vapor, oxygen, and sunlight in a photochemical reaction to form secondary pollutants of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Sulfuric acid, acid and nitric acid are two of the strongest acids that we have in existence. And what happens is that while they are in the air, while they're in the atmosphere, they will uh, attach themselves onto precipitation and precipitate out of the atmosphere in the form of acid rain. And acid rain can be really damaging. Acid rain can basically acidically erode anything it touches. So it can cause soils to be uh, leached of their nutrients and it can alter alter soil chemistry. It can uh, implement uh, toxic metal ions. It can uh, affect surface water pH and kill fish. It can damage plants and crops and it can damage human infrastructure. Look over here on the right hand side and you can see the effects of acid rain deposition on gravestones where it's essentially eroding and uh, destroying these gravestones to the point where they're almost unlegible, and eventually, if it continues, it will erode those gravestones down to nothing. Now, there have been some solutions to acid rain, and typically, the acid rain program is managed under the Clean Air Act. Basically, we have set up emission standards for how much uh, sulfur dioxide and nitric oxides can be emitted into the atmosphere, and we've gradually put a cap on these uh, these pollutants and basically force the implementation of scrubbers, electrostatic precipitators, and other forms of uh, scrubbing mechanisms and technology which limits the release of sulfur dioxide and nitric oxides into the atmosphere. Basically, by controlling these uh, pollutants at their source, we limit their addition into the atmosphere where they can affect us in the form of acid rain. So for the latter half of the lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about indoor air pollution. And so if you remember, outdoor air pollution was air pollution that was released outside of human infrastructure, so in the ambient environment. Indoor air pollution results in pollution being released indoors, so inside of human infrastructure. This can be homes, buildings, cars, anywhere where we are encapsulated in some sort of space. And indoor air pollution is notable because it can actually be, and often is, worse than outdoor air pollution. And this is for a variety of reasons. Generally, indoor Indoor air pollution or indoor air contains higher concentrations of pollutants compared to the outside. And in addition, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. So we barely are ever outside or outdoors anyway. So the, the impacts of indoor air pollution are far worse for us than they are for than outdoor air pollution simply because of where we are at for the majority of our, our time. For example, you're indoors watching this right now, I can almost guarantee it. So in doing so, we really need to be cognizant of the indoor air pollution sources as well as how to mitigate them.
Now, there are several sources of indoor air pollution, and it varies from place to place whether you're in a developing or developed country. In developed countries, such as the United States, Canada, or Europe, synthetic products are normally going to be the biggest offenders, and this is because consumer products are rarely tested for their, and for their air quality indoors. Basically, when we are looking at assessing indoor air pollution, these cleaning products are normally going to be the biggest offenders, simply because they are poorly tested for how often or how long the, the residence times of these chemicals are indoors. Basically, as we're walking around, we're constantly restirring up these chemicals over and over again, and so they can contribute drastically to indoor air pollution. These cleaning products usually also have carcinogenic substances, basically cancer-causing substances that we inhale, and so this can be a bit of a problem. In developing countries, however, the issue is far different and far worse. The biggest issue for in developing countries with indoor air pollution is that they are often very reliant on wood and biofuels in order to produce heat. Often that biofuel, the exhaust, will be trapped inside the indoors and it will be recirculating over and over again. And so these biofuels and the byproducts of these biofuels can have serious problems with smoke inhalation. So while we have uh, consumer products as the number one cause of air, indoor air pollution for the United States, in developing countries it is often exhaust and uh, from biofuels. And so here are just a number of different sources for indoor air pollution within developed countries. Now there are a lot of them and I encourage you to look over every single one of them. However, I'm not going to go over every one of them for the purposes of this lecture. Now again, be, be cognizant of these, be aware of the different inputs for indoor air pollution so that if they pop up as a quiz question or as an exam question, you'll be ready to answer that. But again, I'm, I'm not going to be going over uh, these individually. Now this is the last lecture for chapter 13. I look forward to seeing you again for chapter 14 where we will be going over climate change. See you then.